Hello and welcome to our virtual lunch and learn today. We're talking about industrial network infrastructure, your future business foundation. My name is Rachel Green and I'm the digital communication specialist here at McNaught McKay Electric Company. And presenting for us today will be Brent Murray, industrial channel account manager for the Great Lakes region at Panduit. Today he's joining us from Lexington, Kentucky. And also on the live stream today is Drew Clawson, Solutions Architect with McNaught McKay, joining us from Columbus, Ohio. Feel free to enter your questions in the comments at any time, and we'll have a Q&A portion at the end for Brent and Drew to answer those. We'll be getting started shortly, but we'd like to allow a few minutes for attendees to join us here on the live stream. As you come in, let us know where you're tuning in from in the comment section. You can view recordings of previous virtual lunch and learns on our YouTube channel under the virtual lunch and learn playlist. And we cover a new topic every Wednesday at noon. So be sure to join us on your lunch break. For anyone just coming in, welcome to our virtual lunch and learn today, industrial network infrastructure, your future business foundation. Let us know where you're joining us from. Feel free to type any questions you have in the comment section while our presenter Brent Murray discusses essential knowledge and tactics in current, near future, and distant future time domains that guide your network plans. Our specialist Drew Clausen is also on the live stream today, and together he and Brent will be answering your questions in the Q&A segment at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to reach out afterward or if you have further questions for Brent and Drew, you can send us an email at macamaclive at mc-mc.com. Be sure to let us know which session you attended, and we'll have that email address on the screen at the end for you as well. Looks like we have a number of attendees with us now, so let's go ahead and get started. Brent, I'll pass it over to you. Hey, thank you, Rachel. And, and to start off with, I just wanna say hello and thank you for all uh, attending the webinar today. So let's let's begin by just talking a little bit about Panduit and the industrial network infrastructure goals. You know, our goal at Panduit is to simplify industrial network deployment for better equipment optimization and broader risk management with Panduit's reliable integrated IT and OT architecture. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of the industrial network. You know, how important is an industrial network to the business it supports? Well, it, it is uh, in many folds across the organization. You know, we tend to think of the network of how they affect us in the office space and where a slowdown or brief outage might make for talk around the water cooler. But in contrast, with industrial networks, they control and communicate status of profit-making assets and therefore has impacts to workforce productivity significantly. And outages and slowdowns are extremely visible and readily monetized, often with career limiting consequences. A network outage can hamper or even idle a very productive workforce during an unplanned outage, causing the business to not only lose production output, but incur salary costs that don't result in profitable production. While network health is not the sole focus of the business, it is what uh, it is. If it was not causing the problem, the business would and could focus on more important tasks. We will touch on why it is important to have both a current plan and a future looking network plan. So let's take a moment uh, to look at the network cost distribution. As we study uh, project expenditures, We've examined the relationship between network elements and where dollars are invested. First, let's take a look at software. It consumes a sizable 60% of a project budget with a short life of two to five years. Software updates drive process improvements that enhance profits. Network hardware comes in second place, claiming another good sized budget chunk at 23%, again, with a maximum life of five years. Typically, industrial gear will continue to be used much longer, but if it's got Intel inside, it changes out faster every three to five years. Operation aspects of the network are 10% of the budget. Examples might be field technology, tablets, and such. 
they too have an asset life of about five years. And finally, the network inf uh, physical infrastructure cabling, et cetera, is only about 7% of the project spend, but we expect it to last over 20 years. It's often viewed the relief valve used to control initial costs, but in turn determines how well new technologies can be adopted over time. We can see the switch hardware and people technology will change out at least four times over the infrastructure lifespan. How tech driven is the company we are working with? Knowing that answer can help us make better decision choices or design choices, I should say. And we also know that a large percentage of network problems, 50% or greater, depending on who you ask, happen in the physical layer. What is the cost of downtime? What pain does it cause? Does our design need greater flex or reliability? Uh, we are not saying to flip the triangle in terms of investment, but we can use the life cycle of components to plan smartly. So we also thought to look at what types of things the best in class manufacturers do in their networks. Aberdeen Research conducted a study in regards in this regards and identified the best in class and what things they do more or less of in comparison with the rest in this study. These are things related to physical network health. There are four key areas we show here. Reliability built into the network physical layer, data link reliability, network management, alignment of physical layer deployment with industrial network architecture. They identified the best in class in terms of reporting OEE, TCO, and uptime. And these best in class customers are 99.91% .91 uptime, 11% reduction in TCO, and 90% OEE or overall equipment effectiveness for discrete manufacturers, where OEE or you know 80 as at 80% is considered actually world class performance, but 25% higher operating margin contribution. These are the ones considered best in class. This information is evidence that we should pay attention to designing for reliability and planning to an architecture and maybe even adopting some of those IT practices where it makes sense as they are all contributors to great success on the plant floor. So where do we start in the process? We wanna start by considering what's out there. We saw that many are conducting network management, uh, which is, is uh, really good. But the part of the problem is how we document. If we make prints, they're usually good on the first day. And then after that, everything changes. It's a little uh, facetious, but actually not all that far off. It's far easier to make a change in the pinch, in a pinch, but far harder to document it and updating CAD for a minor change is not typically viewed as a high value activity. It tends to wait. Our experience is that typical plant floor scans turns up 20 undocumented devices operating on the network. A mitigation plan for problems that may occur uh, would include reliability or redundancy planning comes into play here. Real-time information on the network, very important to avoid unforeseen effects. A published network maintenance and operating strategy. And, and this is where stakeholders in, part, in the network play a part. Put in some fence posts on the, what the network should be. And then lastly, uh, a future looking plan. Planning for when changes will be made. What is the design we are building towards, but also legacy protocol migrations. And sometimes these changes are driven by the ability to support systems as well. As the workforce changes, older generations take a lot of knowledge with them as they retire. And new generations come along, want different technology choices for support and operation. 
So why do we need to be concerned about industrial Ethernet and the control panel? Ethernet is growing at a fast pace within the panel. It represents 59% of all the nodes on the plant floor in 2021 and is growing at 20%. The simplicity to implement with the ability to pull data and connect it back to the enterprise are key drivers behind Ethernet being the dominant protocol. And the presence of Ethernet devices and industrial managed network switches are common in control panels today. So utilizing network management tools. Functionally, the network management tools give us the ability to document the current state of the network, monitor network readiness, gauge network performance, and find faults and misconfigurations, and all through a simple single pane of glass. Network management tools are a valuable asset all throughout the life cycle of the network from doing health checks, assessments through operations, and future planning. At Panduit, we use Interview Edge to accomplish this. This is a Linux-based box that allows visibility of the entire network, allows you to uh, document the overall topology of the network, and also provides an easy exportable file uh, of all the IP addresses that are connected to the network. It also provides real-time monitoring of the network, putting it in a simple red, yellow, green format to help OT communicate back to IT to resolve problems. Looking at standards and best practices and codes together help us also classify, identify risks, and propose solutions to common situations. These common situations include improper copper terminations, unprotected, unmanaged fiber strands, uh, no defined pathways or cable management, and ad hoc device implementation, such as closet shelf. So we wanna show here an example of how a logical and physical systems align well in three key elements we can call out. The reference architectures are heavily driven by uh, custom controls or customer controls vendors uh, choices and designer preferences as well. But here is a, how the physical can align to varying logical models. First, the uh, all the same uh, major, excuse me, all the major controls vendor have some type of reference architecture. Many are based from the basic Purdue model which we show here in the colors. This is the basis for the logical reference architecture. The second one is the physical network is built aligned to the Telecommunication Industry Association or TIA 1005-A, which is the premises for st or standard for the industrial environment. We have overlaid the Purdue model to the TIA 1005-A's distributor model here to align very well by design. Third, we can build switch uh, distribution to align with TIA 1005-A, enabling testing and validation at each uh, subsystem level. And this is where, with the experience of our design and deployment partners, such as McNaughton McKay Network Services, we can adopt a format that provides reliability in the OT environment and adopts the best practices of IT systems. As I mentioned earlier, many Ethernet devices are now present in layers 0 through 1 and cabling subsystem 1. This extends to those field connections at the I.O. sensor level, smart locks, hardened switches, cameras, and other devices that will be in harsh environments and need to make connection back into the control panel. The architecture provides a way to plan the cabling infrastructure and manufacturers build standards based for product solutions, such as M12 X code and D code type solu cabling solutions to better meet the MICE requirements referenced in the TIA 1005 standard. Following that architecture better enables 
that system to be testable out to the edge and to the last device. This gives confidence that the panel built will perform in a plant network uh, designed to meet the same architecture. So now let's take a look at a few uh, future areas that may be of interest. So some technologies to monitor uh, as, we, as we move forward. First of all, it's power over ethernet. Now this isn't terribly new, but it is becoming uh, a greater impact on the manufacturing floor. Uh, we're seeing more and more IP cameras out on the manufacturing floor, inspection cameras moving over to PoE, Ethernet encoders, and other devices, and it's going to change the landscape of the, uh, the manufacturing environment, specifically how we apply power to devices. Next is time-sensitive networking. So initially, time-sensitive networking was uh, primary application was ensuring that the video and audio were synchronized on video. But now time-sensitive networking is really being used for industrial control applications such as motion control uh, and uh, robotics where time synchronization is key. Then we have software-defined networking. Uh, which again is not terribly new, but new to the manufacturing floor. And this is going to enable us to use, um, you know, redirect uh, bandwidth, you know, from a software standpoint to take advantage of um, maybe cloud hosting or something of that nature. And then the last one, which I'm going to dive into a little bit more, is single pair Ethernet. This is a new technology uh, that is. <laughs> really, really going to change how we tie all the networks in a manufacturing facility together. Let's dive into this just a little bit. So today, field bus cable is used to connect devices in industrial and building automation. You've got instrumentation, we've got controllers, IO modules, valves, lights, shades, access control, HVAC, a number of devices around uh, the the building itself and manufacturing environment. So typical serial cable terminations that are used in these applications might be, uh, you know, and these are actually network names, Profibus, Modbus, Foundation Field Bus, KNX, BACnet, et cetera. But we could potentially use just standard Ethernet, you know, four pair type of Ethernet to address these type of challenges, but may be a little overkill and also may not uh, be as cost effective as we may need it to be, may not go those long distances. So when we take a look at single pair Ethernet uh, compared to uh, other uh, networks and that type of thing, you know, your, your traditional a uh, four pair network has a distance of only running about 100 meters. And, and that's really uh, too short of a distance to catch that IP camera on the corner of a building or maybe that uh, HVAC system or whatever. So it can be quite limiting. What single pair Ethernet allows us to do is go up to 1,000 meters in reach. Now, we give up a little bit in speed. Uh, we've got a bandwidth of only 10 megabaud. But at the same time, you know, that's fast enough to take on most camera applications and again, get us that longer distance. It also has the capability of doing power delivery uh, of up to 60 watts. So with that power delivery capability, it really opens the door to uh, non-traditional devices that, you know, instead of doing the traditional ethernet devices, we can take on uh, those other uh, devices, like we said, HVAC, instrumentation, that type of thing. So single pair Ethernet was built to bring Ethernet to the edge of the industrial and process automation. And here we're showing it, uh, actually showing on the, on the Purdue model itself. And we're showing devices that are already uh, on Ethernet. But now we're evolving and, and adding additional level zero and level one devices on Ethernet. And when we look at single pair Ethernet, it was really help, you know, built to help break down the, the functional automation silos in building automation. So, you know, before we had completely separate and diverse networks uh, between the controls network and the HVAC network and lighting and that type of thing. This allows us to have a single network to control all. 
And with that single network, we, we lose all those interfaces from Ethernet to BagNet or Ethernet to Modbus. So it simplifies the complexity there. But then also uh, take, a, you know, take a view back or a step back and think about security and being able to manage security on a single network and not have to worry about you know, three, four, five different types of networks. So this is really a game changer. And I think uh, because of uh, almost security alone, uh, it'll speed up the implementation of single pair ethernet. So a little bit about the cable. Uh, cables for uh, you know building automation and field bus are typically two conductors and a shield. So on the left, I'm showing a profi bus connection. Uh, next one over is a foundation field bus, uh, backnet, and then we're showing single pair ethernet. So single pair ethernet has a little bit more stringent requirements, but is backwards compatible to the other field buses. So in the event that you wanted to quote unquote future proof a facility, this type of technology uh, would, would allow you to, you know, you could put in single pair ethernet as a cable and uh, still put profi bus over it or foundation field bus over it until uh, you adopted single pair ethernet going forward. So here we're showing a little bit about the connectivity. Uh, you can see on the left side, uh, there is actually an industrial connectivity uh, with a M12 type connector. Uh, so this would be used in you know, IP67 type applications. And then there's also uh, a similar to a, an RJ45 uh, plug, uh, similar to that, except designed for single pair ethernet. Very small in size, very compact. So this is just a, a couple of the uh, additional technologies to take into consideration as we, as we start to design the network. So I think we need to, to pause for just a minute and see if there's any questions. Rachel, are there any questions that have come in so far? Um, we don't have any questions in the comments at this time. If you want to um, keep going here, and we'll give everyone an opportunity to ask those questions if they have them. Okay. So let's just start with a couple of questions we get all the time. So where do I go to obtain an assessment uh, of my existing network? Drew, would you mind weighing in on that? Hey, Brent. Yep. I would love to jump in here. Uh, I want to say hi to everybody uh, that's joining us today, and then. Uh, joining us on demand here, um, was really excited to have Brent and Panduit involved in this uh, Lunch and Learn today. Uh, Panduit has been a great partner to uh, McNaughton McKay and specifically to the network services portion of uh, services and solutions. Uh, we've done a lot of projects over the years. Um, they've been an excellent partner. And so Brent, I just really wanted to thank you for your time today. Um, the, the question we've got here is where do I go to obtain an assessment for my exi existing, existing network? Uh, well, it's a very simple answer here uh, at McNaughton McKay. We've got our network services team. Uh, we do network assessments. Uh, we also do traffic analysis and uh, what we call a network triage to go in and really pinpoint what's going on on an existing network. Um, we've got a whole uh, set of tools and engineers that we are able to deploy and really will give us that foundational uh, knowledge base to then go and uh, recommend remediations uh, on an existing network. Um, from um, maybe a network that, that doesn't exist yet. Uh, we work really closely in, in partnership with, with Rockwell and, and Panduit uh, to really design and then uh, deploy it. And I think that maybe leads in, Brent, here to, to your next question. Uh, if you know that your network needs a complete overhaul, uh, do I need an assessment? Uh, well, yes, you do. Uh, again, it's gonna give us a foundation to, to go off of. We typically do a assessment or traffic analysis initially, and then we typically do one uh, you know, post-project uh, to see uh, if everything has been uh, cleared up and um, uh, you know, laid out um, uh, per the physical and uh, logical designs uh, that, we, that we do um, on the outset of the project itself. Okay, and then we have a third question. You know, I'm in the budgeting phase of a project that requires a network infrastructure. How do I budget for the cost of a network? And I'd like to address this. You know, many times we engage with customers to do a front end engineering design 
so that the customer can get an idea of what the, the scope of the project is going to be and how much it's actually going to cost. Uh, this is a great uh, effort to go into a project with. That way it alleviates all the unknowns and, and makes the, um, the network front and center. So today the network uh, in most plants is just as important as the 480 volt infrastructure or the electrical infrastructure. And, but many times, because it doesn't require a, a PE stamp, uh, folks don't take the time to put the, the efforts in the network up front. And by doing a front end engineering design, it makes sure that that's you know, put front and center and everybody knows what the network needs to accomplish and how much it's gonna cost at the end. So, Rachel, any other questions that have popped up? We don't have any live questions in the chat at this time, but we'll give a few minutes here in case anyone has some for you. And okay. while we look, I'd like to remind you all that you can reach out to us at the email address macandmaclive at mc-mc.com. We will have that on the screen for you in, in just a few seconds here. Um, just be sure to let us know the name of the session you attended and we'll get your question to the right person. All right. I want to thank um, you, Brent, for this wonderful presentation here today. And thank you to Drew for joining us as well. And a big thank you to all of our live viewers for your time here today. We hope this session was informative and engaging for you. Remember to subscribe to the McNaught McKay YouTube channel for more industry content. And we look forward to seeing you live again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Have a great day.